for joining us on Arirang News. I'm Kim Dam Min Chong. Russian leader Vladimir Putin arrived in Pyongyang early Wednesday, where he was greeted by the regime's leader Kim Jong Un. The two are set to hold a series of talks, both open and in private, during Putin's one-day stay there. And on the same day, foreign and defense officials of South Korea and China held talks for the first time in nearly a decade. This horror voiced concerns over Putin's North Korea trip, whereas China remained rather neutral about it. The S&P 500 hit yet another new all-time high for the second day in a row on Tuesday, driven by AI momentum. Now, NVIDIA beats Microsoft to become the most valuable company in the world. Russian leader Vladimir Putin touched down in Pyongyang early this morning ahead of the third ever summit with Kim Jong-un. Putin is expected to spend this one-day trip exploring ways to deepen Moscow's ties with Pyongyang. Our North Korean Affairs correspondent Kim Jong-sil starts us off. A plane with Russia written on the side arrives at Pyongyang International Airport in the early hours of Wednesday morning, carrying Russian President Vladimir Putin for his first visit to North Korea in 24 years. Putin gets off the plane and greets North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. The two leaders embrace each other twice and then walk the red carpet while talking to each other before getting into an hour's limousine. The luxury Russian car reportedly belongs to Putin and is similar to the one gifted to Kim in February. The North's leader accompanied Putin to the Gumsusan Guest Palace, an accommodation used by Chinese President Xi Jinping in 2019. After a welcome ceremony at around noon, a 90-minute summit is expected to take place between the two leaders. Much of side focus is on what may be included in a comprehensive strategic partnership agreement between Russia and North Korea, with both sides expected to sign the agreement before Putin heads to Vietnam later in the day. How do you think this uh, signing of the uh, comprehensive strategic partnership agreement will change the relationship dynamics of Pyongyang and Moscow? The Comprehensive Strategic Partnership Agreement is at a much higher level than current treaties between Russia and North Korea on friendly cooperation. It can go as close as a military alliance, so we are keeping a close eye on whether it might include an automatic military intervention or something similar. Putin's visit is also being closely monitored by Washington. With regard to um, Mr. Putin and his travels uh, to North Korea, look, we've seen as you've said, Russia try uh, in desperation to develop uh, and to strengthen relations with countries that can provide it with what it needs to continue the war of aggression that it started against Ukraine. Experts in South Korea say it's important that the South Korean government keep a close eye on all discussions taking place between Russia and North Korea and share the information with the international community. Kim Jong-sil, Arirang News. South Korea has expressed concerns over Putin's visit to North Korea during rare high-level talks with China. And high-level talks with China continue this week as Seoul aims to boost cooperation with Beijing. Our foreign affairs correspondent, Peonji, reports. Foreign and defense officials from South Korea and China met in Seoul for high-level talks on Tuesday, the same day that Russian President Vladimir Putin headed to North Korea. During the meeting, South Korea expressed concerns over Putin's visit to Pyongyang, highlighting that this should not lead to stronger military cooperation between Russia and North Korea. It once again asked China to play a constructive role in order to achieve denuclearization. In response, China said its policy towards the Korean Peninsula has not changed and said it will play a constructive role in resolving issues in the region. Tuesday's 2 plus 2 meeting was led by Vice Foreign Minister Kim hong yun and his Chinese counterpart Sun Weidong. The two countries agreed to hold such talks last month when President Yoon suk yeol sat down for a separate bilateral meeting with Chinese Premier Lee Chang on the sidelines of the trilateral summit with Japan. The dialogue was first established in June 2013 and was held that year and in 2015 between Director General level officials. The meeting has not taken place since then amid strained bilateral relations after South Korea agreed to deploy a U.S. missile defense shield called the Thought System. Meanwhile, another high-level Chinese official is set to visit South Korea. The foreign ministry announced that Shin Chang-shing, 
The chief of China's Changsu province will visit South Korea for two days, starting Wednesday. It's a visit by a top Chinese provincial government official amid recent high-level exchanges between South Korea and China. We expect this opportunity to boost practical cooperation between South Korea and China. Changsu province, located on the east coast of China, has the second largest economy among provincial governments in the country and has close trade and investment ties with South Korea. While in Seoul, Sin is set to meet with South Korea's trade minister, as well as business people in the country. Peunz, Arirang News. In the meantime, North Korean trips once again crossed over the inter-Korean border after doing so earlier this month. Now the move is seen as the North showing, a, showing of its war readiness. Our defense correspondent Choi min -jung reports. North Korean troops briefly crossed the military demarcation line again Tuesday morning. According to the Joint Chiefs of Staff, some 20 to 30 North Korean soldiers intruded over the border at around 8.30 a.m. They immediately returned north after the South Korean military fired warning shots and aired warning messages. A similar intrusion took place on June 9 when troops appeared to get lost while working in the DMZ. As was the case then, the South Korean military says Tuesday's border crossing appears to be accidental. The regime has been actively deploying troops to the front line for various construction activities. A military official said dozens, if not hundreds, have been deployed every day since April at around 10 different places within the DMZ. The military identified ongoing activities related to the laying of mines and the clearing of wasteland, the reinforcement of tactical roads, and the installation of anti-tank barriers. Such trends have continued for the past two months, and various activities are underway within the demilitarized zone currently as well. A military official also pointed out that several North Korean soldiers have reportedly been killed or injured while laying mines. Some experts say Pyongyang might be trying to broadcast its war readiness as North Korea has restored its frontline guard posts and dismantled railways connecting the two Koreas since suspending the September 19th inter-Korean military agreement last November. However, the South's military assesses that the measures are mainly aimed at strengthening internal control, especially to prevent North Koreans from defecting. As North Korea is expected to do more construction work within the DMZ, South Korea says it is closely cooperating with the United Nations command to prepare for future eventuality. Choi min -jung, Arirang News. No major disruptions to the medical treatment have been reported on the first day of community doctors' nationwide walkout on Tuesday. But the South Korean government warns that those engaging in illegal acts will be held responsible. Moon hye has the details. Nationwide strikes led by the Korean Medical Association has resulted in little disruption for patients so far, but stern responses from the government. The health ministry reported that just under 15 percent of medical institutions around the country staged walkouts on Tuesday. But so far there has been no major break in medical treatment at community hospitals. During a rally on the same day, the KMA announced that it will start an indefinite walkout next Thursday should the government not meet what it claims are justified demands from doctors. Doctors were immediately ordered to return to work, with the government stating that failure to comply could lead to medical license suspensions. The KMA was also reported to the Fair Trade Commission for encouraging the illegal practice of refusing to treat patients. During a cabinet meeting on Tuesday, President Yoon Sagar stipulated that such illegal actions must be met with an appropriate punitive response. He further emphasized that doctors should communicate their opinions instead of resorting to drastic measures, calling on junior doctors and medical students to resume their studies, and promising to provide the necessary support for them to do so. Medical professors at Seoul National University hospitals began an indefinite walkout the previous day, leading to the number of outpatient treatments at the hospital dropping by 27 percent on the first day. The Education Ministry responded by informing each university that professors participating in collective leave of absence from university hospitals could be subject to disciplinary action. 
But with medical professors at other major university hospitals commonly dubbed the Big Five, such as Yonta University, also set to join the walkouts next week, and others in discussion to do so too. Concerns are growing over how this could develop. The Catholic University of Korea is due to gather its medical professors on Thursday to discuss this matter, and professors at Sungyungwan University are also to convene soon. In an effort to minimize severe medical disruptions, the government has implemented a rotational on-call system for emergency cases. Moon Haeryeon, Arirang News. The S&P 500 continues to rise as it reached another record high for the second straight day. With the index rising on AI momentum, NVIDIA surpassed Microsoft as the most valuable stock. Lee Seung-ja has more. Both the S&P 500 and Nasdaq closed at record highs on Tuesday, with the S&P 500 hitting a new all-time high for the second day straight. The S&P 500 rose 13.80 points, or 0.25 percent, to close the trading session at 5,487.03, while the tech-heavy Nasdaq ending 5.21 points, or 0.03 percent higher, to reach an all-time high of 17,862.23 points. The Standard & Poor's 500 is an index that tracks the stock performance of 500 of the largest companies listed on stock exchanges in the United States. It's one of the most commonly followed equity indexes and includes approximately 80 percent of the total market capitalization of U.S. listed public companies. The index also reached an all-time high for the 31st time this year, driven by AI momentum. And much of that AI-driven push can be attributed to NVIDIA. Dubbed Wall Street's AI poster child, the tech firm is now the most valuable company in the world, surpassing Microsoft for the title. NVIDIA shares rose 3.5 percent higher on Tuesday, while Microsoft fell 0.5 percent. Its market cap now stands at roughly 3.34 trillion U.S. dollars. The U.S. chipmaker has enjoyed a massive surge for the past 18 months as its chips are unmatched in producing processors that power AI systems, including generative AI, the technology behind OpenAI's ChatGPT. Lee Seung-jae, Arirang News. The Israeli military said Tuesday that its plans for an attack in southern Lebanon have been approved amid growing clashes with Iran-backed Hezbollah militants. The Israel Defense Forces said that steps have been taken to accelerate readiness in the field, with the Israeli foreign minister threatening to destroy Hezbollah in an all-out war. Tensions have been flaring along the Lebanese border with Israel as Israeli forces have been exchanging cross-border attacks with the militant group. The governor of New Mexico has declared a state of emergency for areas affected by wildfires that have reportedly killed one person in the U.S. state. Two fires that started on Monday forced the evacuation of a town of more than 7,000 people, damaged 500 structures, and burned up almost 73 square kilometers of land. The larger fire, dubbed the South Fork Fire, was discovered at around 9 a.m. Monday and affected a populated tribal area. The second fire was spotted Monday afternoon, mostly in inaccessible mountainous areas. And as of midday Tuesday local time, officials said both fires remain active and are 0 percent contained. Some good news now for fans of BTS with an announcement on Jimin's latest solo album. Titled Muse, the K-pop superstar's second album is set to be released on July 19th. The group's agency Big Hit Music shared the news on social media and the fan community platform Weavers. Jimin's track Closer Than This, which was released shortly after he began mandatory military service last December, will be one of the seven tracks on Muse. And adding to the excitement for K-pop fans is the release of a new solo track from Blackpink's Lisa on June 28th. A historical site near Gwangamun Square, which served as a key political office during the Joseon dynasty, has been reopened to the public after years of restoration works. Our Choi Soo-hyung takes us there. 
After eight years of restoration, the site of the State Council of the Joseon Dynasty, or Uijongbu, is open to the people again from Tuesday. It is a symbolic heritage site near the Gwanghamun Gate, one of the landmarks in central Seoul. During the dynasty, the Uijongbu was the highest office, led by the three highest-ranking officials that advised the king and deliberated over key problems. Following the Japanese occupation, most of its main buildings were destroyed and the land used for colonial offices. In 2016, the Seoul Metropolitan Government began to restore the site. The Uijongbu State Council Site Square project aimed to restore the historical and cultural landscape around the Gwangamun area and return it to the people, emphasizing its significant academic value. The sites of the three main buildings which had been buried for over 100 years and the small garden where the officials rested were uncovered together. People can relax and feel the history within the newly created garden right beside where the old pond and pavilion used to be. Visitors also can experience the authentic atmosphere of that time through the preserved old stone paths and some new square foundation stones. I was curious. I wondered how the structure had been restored and what the old Yejongbu would look like. That's why I came out here on purpose. I think it's wonderful that um, the, the government has enabled people to uh, have a view of the restored um, sites, that it shows the connection between and the importance of the history for the people of South Korea, that they take note of the um, heritage sites and that they are now able to have them open up for the public, which I think is very significant that the public are able to see that and that you can share your history with, with the world in a sense. The State Council site is open 24 hours a day, while an official opening ceremony is scheduled for mid-July. Cho Hyung, Arirang News. At this time of the year, South Korea's southernmost resort island of Jeju becomes a popular spot for vividly colored hydrangea flowers. Our Park Kwon went there. Jeju Island is widely known for its different kinds of flowers that bloom by season. In summer, hydrangeas blossom in several spots across the island, especially in the southern part. At this time of year, Jeju is one of the best places to visit and take nice pictures with hydrangeas. As you can see, there's a wide variety of pastel color hydrangeas in pink, purple, blue, and many more. With these flowers, many tourist attractions on the island, including natural parks and botanical gardens, hold hydrangea festivals. Hueri Natural Park is known to have Jeju's longest hydrangea festival, running from March until August. Hydrangeas, especially the purple ones, are so beautiful. I think it was really worth it coming here. It's so peaceful listening to the birds singing and feeling the fresh air in nature. It feels great to be here with my high school classmates, meeting them after a long time. It's soothing as the hydrangeas bloom beautifully. I'm going to visit here again. Foreign tourists also enjoy their time at the festival, saying that it's different from where they come from. I've like really enjoyed the experience. Um, it's my first time being in an area this kind of like surrounded by the hydrangeas. They're a favorite flower of mine, so just being here has been really peaceful. And also the people around have been very like relaxed and nice, and it just has great vibes. <laughs> I mean, in Singapore, we don't usually get a lot of opportunities to see so many pretty flowers like with these colors, and we don't get many parks like this, so I'm not used to this kind of tranquility. As the relaxing hydrangea festivals are held until the end of summer, why not visit Jeju to experience the beautiful vibes of hydrangeas? Park Geun-woo, Arirang News, Jeju. Let's take a look at the latest news in the world now. We begin today in the U.S., where President Joe Biden on Tuesday local time announced a new policy aimed at protecting hundreds of thousands of undocumented spouses of U.S. citizens from deportation. Under Tuesday's executive order, some 500,000 people will be shielded from deportation, given the right to work in the U.S., and a guided pathway to U.S. citizenship. The program applies to those who have lived in the U.S. for at least 10 years as of June 17th, while some 50,000 children under the age of 21 with a U.S. citizen parent would also be eligible. 
While Biden's new executive action is widely seen as one of the most significant policies to protect immigrants since Obama's Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program enacted 12 years ago, Republican Senator Bill Cassidy said that Biden's got a political problem in that he's going to shut the border down while also reassuring his progressive left. With the support of nearly all of the country's lawmakers, Thailand's Senate on Tuesday passed a final reading of a marriage equality law, leaving only the royal approval before Thailand becomes the first country in Southeast Asia to recognize same-sex couples. The 152-member Thai Senate voted overwhelmingly in favor, with 130 votes for and only four votes against, while 18 senators abstained. The Marriage Equality Act includes amendments to the language in Thailand's civil and commercial code concerning spouses by changing men and women and husband and wife to individuals and marriage partners. Lawmakers and activists were seen celebrating inside and outside of the Thai parliament, waving rainbow flags in solidarity with the LGBT community. The bill now awaits the pro forma endorsement by the King of Thailand, which will then be published in the Royal Gazette, with the bill's effective date set for within 120 days of publication. Now to Saudi Arabia, where the annual five-day Hajj Islamic pilgrimage to Mecca comes to an end on Wednesday. Pilgrims began performing the farewell tawaf on Tuesday, which includes the circling of the Kaaba in Mecca's Grand Mosque for the final time. Scorching heat of up to 51.8 degrees Celsius resulted in a number of casualties this year, where at least 550 pilgrims from Egypt, Jordan, Indonesia, Iran and Senegal have died from mostly heat-related illnesses. According to authorities, more than 1.6 million Muslims from 22 countries travelled to Mecca this year, while around 222,000 Saudi nationals and residents performed Hajj. The Hajj is one of the five pillars of Islam and is a religious duty that must be undertaken by all able-bodied Muslims at least once in their lifetime. Walter, the future reading oracle orangutan at Dortmund Zoo, has his latest predictions saying that Germany will win against Hungary in its second game of Euro 2024. The 35-year-old Sumatran orangutan has predicted World Cup, Euros, as well as European club competition results and made his latest prediction on Tuesday by picking a sack of fresh fruits decorated with the German national football team's scarf first. Walter then went to take the Hungarian scarf as well, which the zoo spokesperson said he interprets as Hungary scoring an honourable goal at the end. Walter predicted Germany's win against Scotland in the Euro opening match. Kim Xiong, Arirang News. Good afternoon. The midsummer heat continues its upward trend across Korea, going 5 to 7 degrees above normal with heat advisories in place for more parts of Korea. Seoul is forecast to have the season's highest temperatures at 35 degrees Celsius. Meanwhile, the monsoon season kicks off on Jeju tonight. And by Friday, Jeju could see up to 200 millimeters of heavy monsoon rain, while the rest of the southern regions could see 5 to 20 millimeters of rain until tomorrow. The rest of the country should be under blazing sunshine with very high UV rays. Afternoon highs could be 1 to 5 degrees higher this afternoon, topping out at 35 degrees here in the capital and Daejeon, Daegu, Gyeongju at 36 degrees Celsius. Tomorrow should be as hot as today. The monsoon season in the central regions usually begins around June 25th, but no exact date has been given by the weather agency yet. Meanwhile, tonight's monsoon rain on Jeju will continue into early next week. With that in mind, let's take a look at the international weather conditions. <music>
That is all we have at this hour. Arirang News will be back at 2 p.m. Korea time. Thanks for watching.